Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so happy to have you here. On behalf of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies and my collaborator, Kate Goldman, we'd like to rec uh, welcome you to today's webinar on developing tools to combat anti-Black racism in the United States. Uh, my name is Elena Shi. I'm an assistant professor of American Studies and Ethnic Studies here at Brown. Uh, and today's webinar is supported uh, in addition to CLACS by the Provost Special Call for Addressing Systemic Racism and particularly advancing knowledge through research and programming around anti-Black racism. In addition to serving as the center manager at CLACS, Kate has found truly impressive ways of bringing issues of translation into our um, intellectual community. And so I'm going to first introduce her, uh, who will tell us a little bit more about um, the ideas behind this project. And then I'll in turn introduce each of the speakers who will give us some informal remarks and we'll open everything up to Q&A for a vibrant discussion. So Kate Goldman holds a BA in political science and modern languages from Union College and an MA in Spanish American literature from Rutgers University. Prior to joining CLAC, she worked as a translator and teacher in the United States and Chile. She is currently the center manager at CLAX and head of academic and university partnerships with Respond Crisis Translation and volunteers as a translator, interpreter, and legal advocate with organizations throughout the United States, including the Brown University Human Rights Asylum Clinic, Al Otro Lado, and the Dili Pro Bono Project. Welcome, Kate. <laughs> Thank you so much, Elena. I am super excited to kick off this project today. Um, as Elena said, we uh, are super grateful to the Pro Provost's office for the funds through the Addressing Systemic Racism Fund, and also grateful to CLAX and the Watson Institute, especially to Ellen White, who has provided excellent support for this event. Um, before I begin, I want to acknowledge that all Brown University buildings are built on occupied indigenous lands specifically the traditional homelands of the Narragansett and Wampanoag peoples. I note too that our campus drew its early lifeblood from the African slave trade in the Americas and that there are buildings at Brown constructed by enslaved peoples. These acknowledgements shared at the opening of this event should commit us to mindfulness on campus or wherever we are right now and to a life of unsettling anti-racist work. So before Professor Shi introduces our panelists, I wanted to briefly introduce the project that we're launching. Um, our goals for this project are pretty ambitious, but the issues that we will explore require that we approach them in such a manner. As many of you know, the plight of migrants and asylum seekers has worsened over the past few years as the Trump administration has taken steps to limit access to asylum legal services and language justice. In Rhode Island, as, many, as in many other US states, these developments have disproportionately affected black migrants and asylum seekers, many of whom do not speak English or Spanish, the languages in which resources and services tend to be provided. Since 2003, Rhode Island has resettled just over 3000 refugee families, the majority of them from Liberia, Democratic Republic of Congo, sorry, and um, Somalia. So upon arrival, many find that their assimilation is shaped by anti-immigrant and anti-Black forms of xenophobia and white supremacy. They find themselves and their families thrust into a racial climate that they have limited tools <clears throat> to navigate. For their part, translators and other providers often have the capacity to meet only the linguistic and legal needs of migrants lacking access to an intersectional toolkit that approaches resource provision through an empowerment and racial justice lens. Our goal is to create such a toolkit. We will work with two partners over the next several months to do so. The first respond to crisis translation. And as Elena mentioned, I um, am part of the leadership team for that organization is a volunteer network that provides remote language services in dozens of languages drawing on the skills of hundreds of volunteers around the world. 
Respond works with partner organizations ranging from internationally known foundations to community-based initiatives. And three of our panelists today are translators and interpreters who uh, work with Respond. Our other partner is the Refugee Youth Power Summit, a two-week intensive program for high school refugee youth in Providence. And their goals are to bring youth leaders in the refugee community together to cultivate critical ideas and tools that are necessary for creating social change and to engage in collective action. And one of our panelists today is from um, our YPS. So we will be working together to create a toolkit and training program, materials in several target languages, uh, and templates for frequently used forms such as US immigration documents and information on COVID-19 in several target languages. So without taking up any more of our time, I am going to ask um, Professor Shi to go ahead and introduce our panelists. So sorry. <clears throat> I'll introduce each of the panelists in the order that they'll speak. And um, first off, I'm very, very excited to welcome and to hear you speak. Welcome Dudu Kone of Senegal, West Africa. Dudu is an English teacher, interpreter, and translator of French to English, Molof. He also leads the Teachers of English Association and coordinates English clubs. And he is joining us from Senegal where it is 8 p.m. tonight. Welcome, Dudu. Yeah, welcome. Okay, so feel free to um, tell us a little bit about your translation work uh, with Respond. Okay, so can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. I greet everyone in the panel. I'm so happy to be with you to, to, tonight or today, uh, whatever, depending on the area that you are. So uh, it's uh, so special for me because I have never shared a panel with uh, uh, Americans or other na native speakers or other people who are not Senegalese because we used to do this kind of activity during the pandemic, but this is the first time that I shared a panel with, with you. Okay, so I'm so grateful and thankful for Respond Crisis for giving, having given me the opportunity to contribute to the great work, the tremendous work that they are doing. And I, I can assure you that since two days, people are asking me about Respond Crisis translation. What is it about? What is their mission? And I, was, I am here as your ambassador explaining people what you're doing, trying to get them to the Facebook page so that they get more information more detail about the work that we're doing and personally uh, i have a great experience of translation and interpreting interpreting because during the holidays i was in my home doing nothing but i got the link and when i got the link i tried to send an email saying that i'm a volunteer and uh, the first day that they called me after the call i felt so much joy but also, I was sad because I imagined myself in the place of the person I was trying to help. So I say this response crisis is doing uh, a noble job because they are trying to support and give hope to somebody that is uh, detained in a center that he, he doesn't know anything about what is going to happen to him. But due to the work of response crisis and the help that the volunteers are giving, we are giving hope back to the immigrants and we are trying to realize a dream because when somebody leaves their homeland it is because they are pushed by some reasons so those reasons can be social can be political it can be also a pressure on their lives on their own lives because some people face trouble in their homeland so when they leave it means that they want a refuge they want some somebody who can accept them and give them hope and make them live a better life that they couldn't make in their homeland. So this is what Respond Crisis is trying to do. And I applaud you. I congratulate you with the great job that you're doing. Personally, I, you, you inspire me to become a human rights activist. I dreamed about it, but I didn't have a path. But now you, you, you are trying to 
to, 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 to put in my mind what to do in the future and also uh, you give me tools that allow me to prepare some projects here in my country and uh, maybe further project with with you but uh, after after some days of translation uh, I, I I noticed that respond crisis has its place in the world because uh, uh, trying to support people who lost their hope who are in a detention center uh, who do not know what will happen to them if you take people to translate for them uh, when I put my, myself in the place of those people, I realized that uh, this is not an easy job, but supporting people and uh, helping them have a better life is a kind of humanism. This is what is from the crisis. The crisis is translation is doing for those people. And congratulations for the job. And I really respect what you're doing. So I would like to talk a bit about uh, black racism, if you allow me. Yeah, black racism, you know, it's not only uh, white people who are uh, who are seen as racist toward blacks, but also there is racism between black residents and black immigrants due to uh, complexity, because I received many stories from people from Africa who went to the United States and who met black people, but they felt that they rejected them through their behavior, through the way they talked. And uh, this is a sign that there is a complexity or a misunderstanding. So people uh, have to respect to one another, understand that we are from different places. We are not the same color, not the same race and areas, but we all are human beings. And as human beings, we should unite, but not reject one another and we all need one another because you are there i'm here but i try to support you and you also you give me some opportunity opportunities that i don't have here in my country so uh, if we are racist and we reject one another uh, the world will be crazy and uh, it will be so difficult to live in this earth, on this earth so i think that uh, when an immigrant goes to the united the us uh, because of the uh, reason that they left in their homeland. When they arrive in the United States, not only all people are racist because uh, the, those who are in the respond crisis who try to help them, they, they, they love all people, they love all races, they love all nations. So this is why they are trying to do that. And if we all unite and respect one another and go beyond race, go beyond religion and racism, maybe we will live in a better in a better world. Thank you so much, Dudu. Um, next up, I'm going to uh, let's see. We have two. Okay, I'm going to welcome Crystal Alexander to give us some remarks. Crystal is uh, the Haitian Creole team lead. Uh, Crystal built out and leads Response Crisis Translations Haitian Creole Volunteer Network. She is originally from Haiti and has always held caregiving and love as key values. Following the devastating earthquake in 2010, she dropped everything to volunteer as a Haitian Creole and French translator on a naval ship with the American Red Cross. In this role, she helped mobilize volunteers to facilitate communication between foreign doctors and Haitian patients in need of life altering procedures for their injuries. She currently works at Google Cloud in the office of the CTO. She's also one of the steering committee members of Google Haiti, a community of 60 plus Haitians and friends of Haiti at Google working towards advancing local entrepreneurship and job creation. Welcome, Crystal. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, I, I believe I was a little late, so I probably missed if there was a question I was supposed to answer to. <laughs> no, just um, just your some of your remarks and experience working as a translator at Respond, um, and then some reflections on anti-Black racism facing the African migrant community. Um, and Haitian. You know, I <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you for clarifying that. <clears throat> um, I, 
I, honestly, I started working with Respondent was an email that I received. Um, and, you know, the moment people say Haitian, I'm always that, not, not just Haitian, I'm always down to help. But I think, you know, especially knowing that language can be a barrier. When I moved to the United States about 19 years ago, I did not speak English. Um, and I needed people to translate for me. So I knew, um, you know, me being able to help was a good thing. Um, and I responded to, to Ariel and it was an instant connection. You know, I started translating and I was calling my mom. I'm like, mom, they're going to need help. And, you know, and I knew, it, and the one thing is I felt in a sense very privileged because I was born in the United States, even though I was raised in Haiti. So there's a lot of things that, you know, a lot of the immigrants are going through even that I didn't, didn't necessarily have to um, go through, but then being able to help them to that process, answer question and making them feel comfortable was very important for me. Um, and I know that um, within our community, not just Haitian, but the black community, we tend to look uh, down upon people that are immigrants. Yes, because, you know, you're coming here, you're taking, you know, it's always like, oh, you're probably on food stamps, you're probably doing all those things, but not thinking about what the person has had to go through. Like listening to those stories when I'm translating, when someone is telling me I'm eight months pregnant and I had to walk from, you know, Chile to all the way to Mexico. And this is what I had to do. To me is how can I look upon someone like that? How can I think they don't deserve or, you know, they must be running from something that is really bad for someone, for a mother to do all that. So for me, um, this work is very important. Um, I, as much as I can, um, um, I try to, you know, not let my view on things kind of, you know, thinking that I'm better <laughs> um, and feeling that everybody deserves a chance to, to have that American dream, like they say. <laughs> um, I'm very cautious about saying that because for us, for a, a different person, it means different things. But honestly, it's just like, I appreciate the work that we are doing and being able to uplift people, give them, let them know it is okay what you are going through and I understand and support them. I hope I answered the question. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, our next speaker, also with Respond, um, Michael Kalisa, is a Rwandan lawyer and transitional justice expert. Over the last 20 years, Michael has worked to restore the rule of law in post-conflict countries across Sub-Saharan Africa. Michael volunteers with Respond Crisis Translation as a Lingala translator and interpreter. Welcome, Michael. Thank you. Thank you for welcoming me. Uh, can you hear me? I don't know if I'm mute properly. Okay. okay. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I feel privileged and honored to, to be part of this uh, panel. And as for my background, I was born and raised in, in Congo, DRC. So from parents were refugees from Rwanda. <clears throat> so all my life long, I knew and I felt what it is to be a refugee and not to belong to. And this is what led me to, to choose uh, to study law and to go to the faculty of law, which I did and uh, I successfully uh, made it. And uh, now I'm an expert in transitional justice. This led me, the reason I chose to do law was to see how I can speak on behalf of the speechless, to speak on behalf of the people who have been marginalized for, for their rights. And, and I found myself like liking it and uh, loving it. And that's what took me from the national jurisdiction from Rwanda and tribunal to meet my wife in Tanzania, who is a US citizen and, and go uh, doing some fellowship at Yale. And also met someone who introduced me to the response crisis, which is Kate, our host. Uh, which I say hi. And I started more or less one year ago and I did my work with uh, Respond was to translate from Lingala and, and Kinyarwanda and English, uh, sorry, and Swahili uh, and French as well. The, so far, 
I've been translated from Lingala to English and also do some translation for policy in Lingala for, for all asylum seekers. Uh, asylum seeker, sorry. Oh, you will excuse also my, sometimes I get confused with the accent. So uh, this, 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 this was part of the translation also. Basically what I found in my experience, my one year experience with uh, the response, what part of racism that I realized was <clears throat> sometimes the immigration or asylum seeker or uh, US immigration or US uh, immigration department or the whole process is taking very lightly uh, the journey or, and they don't have, they don't give really um, a sense of humanity from where they came through and where they passed through. I'll give you an example of two of, of I will call them like my client or people I, I, I help. Those, this person was an MD, is a doctor, uh, is an MD qualified and have to leave, uh, flee his country in Congo, go in the ship up to Latin America, come through uh, to the United States with his wife and he's educated. But when I was going through the translation with the lawyers or to see exactly what it was about, they didn't even really care about which Congo it was from. They didn't, they, they, they just think like Africa is just one, one, one country. It's, it's a continent with 50 different independent sovereign countries. It's like Canada, it's like when you talk about America, is like Canada, United States and Mexico. So it's, it's difficult and I, I couldn't believe um, the, the simplicity and the shortcut that the immigration took to, to just classify this person as not credible and try to send him back uh, to, to, to his country where he was suffering from persecution. That person was, as I was saying, is, is a doctor, is MD, but during the translation, you can even tell from, you can see or can hear from the, the, the lawyer asking, is this person really literate? Like, we, you, always, you already have his all file. You should understand that this person is the MD. He's, he's, he has five or 10 years post secondary in, in university. He's been treating human people. So he is literate. It's just not because he doesn't understand English that you should not consider as a lesser person. That, that's, that was something I felt a little bit uh, frustrated with. And, and it's difficult to try to tell the, 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 the lawyers in charge of it, like, hey, uh, he has more degree than you, but you know, he has his life at the same time. So it's a little bit uh, complicated. So this is something they should really consider when they look at asylum seeker uh, applicant or applications go through it and really study it through to through, you know, <clears throat> this one to his wife. His wife also, his wife was lesser educated than, than him, but is a woman who left three children behind. She was victim of beating and rape because of her husband uh, status. And because of that trauma, whenever they was try to ask her specific question, especially in court, and in court is a little bit, uh, you have to unmask and to tell the truth the way it is. It's a culture shock for, from asylum seeker. So there's something that we, as they call it in English, learned person, they are not learned. So you need a psychology application or to accompany the, with them through the process. So when they felt that, that they failed to meet that criteria, which is so high for them, you think that they are lying or they try to abuse the system. They are like try to get our job or what, try to have whatever they, you think they try to have. No, they're really running from fear of what they've been uh, suffering from. So those are things that I, I found um, as like being, it bit racist because when a lawyer asks a question, it doesn't break down that question for, for, for the person who has different man, mindset from the US. And <clears throat> remember, as one of the panelists say, Kate Crystal was saying the American dream, 
there are people who are already blended 20 years of all their life in America standard, then when they ask a question, it's too loaded for us to understand it. So you need really to break it. And if I fail because I don't understand what you're saying, that doesn't make me a lesser person. It makes me just a new person coming to your system. So you should be more open-minded to know that this person is, is a foreign and regardless of his race, especially if he's black as the former president was saying that shit all countries, you should not really uh, dismiss that, 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 um, that person because he's been through hell and he needs really assistance beyond, uh, beyond just the legal process or administrative process to pass through. So I think it's, it's a little bit um, less responsible or for me, I'll put it blank, it'd be racist to think that all, all black are liars or, or, or not telling the truth. It's just they don't know the language. They, they've been through hell. If they leave a place A, his status, his house, his wife, and his children behind to come here, it's because there's a hope that you can save him and maybe you can save his family. But because he doesn't meet your standard by in answering your question, you think he's a liar. I think is is uh, is is it too much of a shortcut, which is a, is is for me is like a, it's racism, especially if it's black. You don't want those black people. You're more keen to listen to to white people. So I think uh, maybe I welcome more questions to elaborate more. But uh, this is what I want to say. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, and then lastly. Uh, we have the opportunity to hear from somebody who's going to really bring some of these issues locally um, into Providence. So uh, Nuud Mami Francois was born in Tanzania and came to the U.S. at the age of seven, arriving in Providence in 2008. He has worked with the refugee and brown community for many years as a volunteer and eventually becoming one of the founders and youth directors of the Refugee Youth Power Summit. He also served as a counselor and assistant director of the Bright Summer Camp, a summer academic program serving over 80 refugee youth each year. He has given speeches and attended workshops all over Providence, offering inspiration and guidance to other young activists like him. He is currently a student at CCRI, the Community College of Rhode Island, studying computer science and production management. Welcome, Francois. Thank you, thank you. Um, thank you so much for such a beautiful introduction. Um, and it's an honor, honestly, for me to be here and to be given an opportunity to speak. Um, so I, I mostly go by my last name, which is just Francois. Um, <laughs> but other than that, um, um, I've worked with, as she said, with um, the with two uh, refugee um, programs in Providence, which one, the first one I was a, a, a tutee, um, which was um, kind of like a tutoring program for re um, incoming refugees, um, where brown students would be paired with a, uh, with any uh, refugee um, student, and sometimes even adults um, to, you know, help them with um, homework, and as well as like helping them um, learn to, uh, you know, speak a little bit more English, and as well as to, um, learn to adapt to um, the daily things in life, um, like going to a grocery store or uh, knowing like where a grocery store is or just um, as well as like uh, knowing like transportation and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then it grew into a summer camp and I was a camper and then came into a volunteering and then as um came into a counselor and then uh, as she said, I was also a director. Um, a friend of mine, uh, Ricardo, um, he and I, um, he's amazing, um, first of all, but he and I was, uh, were the ones who came up with the idea for uh, the Refugee Youth Power Summit. Um, and we wanted it to be kind of like a group for high school refugees um, to have a space where they can learn, you know, leadership skills. Um, as well as like where they can learn some, so, um, you know, things that are going on um, in terms of like 
politics and as well as like social justice um, and how they can either be involved or what they can do to, um, you know, be a part of like the change. Um, whether if they can't really get involved themselves, you know, um, we're all gradually trying to better one another with learning new things. And, you know, as we learn, we grow. And so um, that's what we uh, um, pretty much like wanted to do. Um, and it was for eight weeks and we um, invited a lot of like, you know, people around from the community as well to come and um, work with us and um, talk to us about projects that they do around the community. Um, and I, that's also, um, I met Elena as well um, at one of our, at, at our first ever summit. Um, and um, since then it's been past, it's been going, it's something that's growing into like, um, you know, as we said, it was like kind of like we wanted to teach people leadership skills. And so now we um, I'm not really in the leadership um, now, but like we have other refugee youth who are now kind of like taking care of that spot. And that's kind of like what the goal was. And, you know, hoping that that's what continues on in the future. Um, and so now is to speak on the anti black racism, correct? OK, so that's interesting. So anti black racism. Um, as a refugee in Providence is very interesting. Um, as many have like, as Dudu has said, and also has uh, Crystal has said is like, uh, you know, they, when, when you come to America and you see other black people, you don't really get the same, you don't really get the kind of like welcoming that as you expected to get. It's, um, you know, in Africa, everyone, you know that whether if you are someone, you know them, whether, whether if it's a stranger or not, everyone knows that we're all brothers and sisters um, because we all have, we're all humans and we all have blood in our veins and a color of the skin is not gonna change a thing. And so um, it was, it's kind of strange. It was very strange when you came to America and people who are, you know, the same color as you, even though you don't speak the same language, just didn't treat you as like, as your own. But they knew that like, you know, we have the same ancestry or the same we also st still have the same blood and same connections um and that part sucked because like you know it sucked because like adapting to america first of all is already hard trying to you know with a language barrier and as well as like not understanding the um the culture of like social culture or even how the um country works itself is kind of hard and then getting you know kind of like being pushed off by your own people is kind of like okay man I want to go back home, you know, something. Um, and another part of like anti-black racism is like the systematic part. And the systematic part is very part is very tough, tough for um, you know black refugees, I'll say, um, or any refugees to be honest, because the language barrier for one is a tough thing, um, as well as like experience is another, um, and. Sometimes like some, some like, you know, jobs require you to um, look a certain way or dress in a certain manner. And sometimes you're not able to just because like, it's not, a, it's not, it's against of like, you know, your morals and it's tough to try to adapt, but you know, like you have to, you know, get money some way or some way or another, but um, it's tough to like, try to make a hard decision of like, you know, something that's very personal and deep meaningful to you and just for you know a simple dollar but um man as well as um man I, I believe also like trying to um interact with people is also something that was um very hard in terms of like anti-black racism um because like the social part is like even though you're a refugee, everyone kind of still has the same opinions that they would have towards you, towards like any other black African American. And I'm only saying that because like a lot of the opinions that are towards black Africans, Amer black African Americans are very negative in a way. Um, just, you know, due to how, I guess like, you know, there, there are many different opinions towards like their parents as well as to how they speak or as to how they um, live. Um, or just their, just black people as, as you know, as a whole are always just being judged. And 
man, coming into a country and not really understanding like what was even going on or what the politics is like here. And then, you know, you're still getting kind of like the same um, treatment as like, you know, like the same, like the same little things that would happen like in person, like, you know, you'd go out in public, like for example, like if you're going out to shop and like you're going to a place where it's well known that like mostly, um, I'll say like, this is mostly like for, it's a very white area and most mostly white people shop here. And when you try to go shop there, you kind of don't really, don't really feel welcome there. You get a lot of side eyes and stuff like that. And so, um, yeah, that's honestly what I could really say on it. But, um, man. Yeah, that's all I really have to say. Thank you, though. No, thank you so much. Um, you do have a fan in the audience, uh, Lily Hartman, who says, happy to see Francois here. I work with Bright um, at Brown and in Providence. And Lily has posed a question specifically to Francois, but I want to open it up to others. I think Crystal might be able to certainly weigh in here as well. And then Michael from Legal Context. Um, do you see any differences in the tr treatment of refugee communities in Rhode Island or in the United States along racial lines as well as ethnic or national lines, despite the fact that maybe all were received through the same refugee resettlement process. For instance, do you see differences in the experiences, um, Francois, of Congolese or Somali refugees versus um, in Rhode Island, we also have a large communities of Southeast Asian refugees and Colombian refugees and maybe posed also to the rest of the panelists as well. Uh, I wouldn't say, okay, I, hmm, hmm. that's tough to say. I, I, I would say that like, yes, I do in a way because um, for, let me see, let me see. It's for between the Congolese, between like, you know, the Congolese or, you know, the Somali refugees, um, they're much, their skin tone is very different compared to um, the Colombian and um, the Colombian and Southeast and like, you know, Asians. But that doesn't mean that they also don't get the same, you know, racist like treatment. Cause like, I've seen many, like many of like my, um, many friends that I've made um, through Bright who are either like um, Southeast, who are Southeast um, Asian, um, they've, you know, just like I have, we've all had like this language barrier. Um, and once like people can kind of pick out that you're not really from America and you're not really like, uh, like aware of like how the country works in a way, like once they can see, once they can tell that you're a refugee, you kind of get like a sort of like, you know, the same treatment of like side eyes and stuff. And people will also start making jokes towards you and start making fun of you just for, um, you know, like, how you speak and as well as to how you dress or your culture um and there's also um a lot of cultural appropriation that happens i'm not gonna lie um so and that's not just for um african refugees that's literally i'll say for most refugees because i find all the refugee countries like very amazing and their cultures are dope and so <laughs> but um that part um definitely there's definitely some racism towards um all refugees um to an extent i would say um if i can add something here i think you know if we compare the like if i, I lived in miami for a while i feel like haitian got the blunt of you know the racism versus if you're looking at people that are from dominican republic again it goes back to the skin color um, but even within our own community, um, I am an immigrant. I, even though I was born in the United States, I consider myself an immigrant because I have an accent. But I can tell you, like, if I walk through the airport and they say, hello, ma'am, how are you doing? And I answer, I won't get stopped. If my father come right after me and he answers because of his, ba solely based on the accent, because he's not able to change it, my dad have a thick accent, uh, my dad will probably get screened and go through secondary. And it's just the assumption that just because 
all of a sudden it's like he's carrying something in his bag. He's probably bringing this stuff for family. Me, I just look like, yes, I'm an immigrant, but you know, it looks like I speak better English all of a sudden. And that makes me all of a sudden better than this one immigrant. And we are no different. This is my father we're talking about. So I think, um, you know, people make assumptions depending on how you carry yourself how much English, because all of a sudden, because I speak better English, um, I am already much better, but it's no different. I'm still the same immigrant that came here. Uh, I may not have taken the boat the way they see it, but, and sometimes people are very shocked. Even, you know, even in where I've worked in the corporate America, people assume because of my accent, um, you know, I came here on a boat, um, with my family. And when I say, and I make it a point, depending on what, um, you know, who's the audience to say, I was born in the United States, raised in Haiti. Um, and you should see people's faces because how was she born in the United States? You were? And people are very shocked because how can you have an accent and be a U.S. citizen? So I think people just, um, sometimes it's just like, the treatment is based on what you look like. The treatment is also based on, you know, how you carry yourself. Um, but at the end of the day, we all at one point will get discriminated against. The treatment will be very different. Um, it might be harsher because my, my, my skin color is just um, deeper than someone else. And it's harsher because I am not able to express myself because English is not my first language. Yeah, I, I completely agree and support whatever has been said. And I'll give you my personal experience. So um, as I was saying, I'm born and raised in, in, in Congo, but uh, I finished my first degree in law in, in, in Rwanda and did my master's degree here in America. So I did it in California. Then I went back uh, to, 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 to Africa to work. And that's where I met my wife. She's a US citizen, she's a good friend of, of Kate. And I've been coming here back and forth like the last seven years, especially because, I mean, those are my in-laws, but she have to come and visit his, her family, but we're based in Africa. So the, I know the, uh, the, the remark that I wanted to say to add is one day, I think two years ago, I got this scholarship to go uh, to, to a teaching scholarship at Yale in transitional justice at Yale University. So from, from Africa, you have to do a, a transit in Europe and from Europe, then you come to the United States. Arriving in, in, in Europe, in Amsterdam, I've been screened by uh, immigration policy, the, the US one, the uh, TSA, they put on the site. Uh, they start asking me questions and they start asking me questions in, uh, in, um, in, in uh, I mean, I don't know the language, but it's, it's a language from Ethiopia. And they assume that I was Ethiopian. And I was telling them, like, I, I don't understand. I'm, I'm not Ethiopian. I'm, I'm from Rwanda. I said, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I thought you were Ethiopian. We are, we are screening Ethiopian for, for, to see if, uh, you, if they're like, they're, the people are, are correct. And then my wife came and said, like, she's your wife? I said, yes. And funny enough, the immigration officer told me, you better stick with her because when you get to the United States, they're going to screen you again. And I found it really funny. It's because of my appearance as, as black, as I look like a terrorist from Al Shabaab, from, from whatever. They, they just assumed that I was not the one who was supposed to be welcome in the United States. And yet, I had a, a, uh, a visa, a scholarship visa from, to come to the United States at Yale. Then I arrived, and I was really pissed off, but I didn't want to show it. So I arrived to the, we landed in, in, in Boston, and, uh, and I wanted to, I didn't want to, I mean, I wanted to process myself my own paper. And my wife went through, and for me, they asked me like two, three time question, and they look at my visa, and, and they look at me, and it's like, who's sponsoring you? It's like, everything is clear there. And then my wife came, I said, are you together? I said, yes, uh, give me one question. And then they went back to come to apologize 
So you've been here in the United States before. So yes, uh, you, uh, when did you do, uh, what did you do first? I so I did my studies here and then I went back and, and um, this is my second time, my third time to come to the United States, but this time is on a job, job uh, purposes. And I said, okay, yes, uh, you're welcome, just pass it. But those are those shows that because of your accent, uh, as Crystal was mentioning, because of the way you look like. Um, now it's just the screen where we see our, our faces. I'm, I'm 6'4", I'm 200 pounds, 220 pounds. So they say, this guy might be, oh, we don't want him in the country, you know? Uh, and and it's, it's really unfair, you know? And, and imagine now if I was really like a refugee, a political refugee seeking asylum for whatever mistreatment that I have back in my country, it'd be harsh, harsh, very harsh for me to pass through the system because of the way I look. And yet I've been experienced really the worst part of my life. That's why I left Africa. I could have left Africa to come to the United States. So I feel that is really unfair. And at the same time, I'm lucky and privileged and I want to give the best of my ability to, to support, uh, respond to the best of my ability to, to really dig up all the unsaid or mistranslation that those asylum, seeker, asylum seekers are having or passing through to the lawyer to understand the credible fear that they are, they are receiving to not going back or to have the case rejected. So yeah, uh, I think the book is the same. It's like there's a clear, perfect book, but the people who apply that book are, are very different. It's like, uh, it's different from me, from you, from another one. Yeah, that's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. And Dudu, do you have any anything you want to share, perhaps from um, things that you've heard from people you've had to translate for, or even um, from your own friends and family, how you all think about different kinds of discrimination that maybe people from Senegal have faced in the United States? Okay, thank you, Crystal. Thank you, Michael. And Francois, really interesting what you're saying. So I just would like to support what, what, what Crystal was saying about the accent. Uh, sometimes it can be a barrier because uh, I can tell you an anecdote in my school. We, ha we are different teachers, but in our university, they, they, you have different branches. You can choose African and American, African uh, literature and civilization, American literature and civilization, or British literature, literature and civilization, but each of them have different accents. So if you have three different teachers who each chose one, one different from the other, when they teach the same student, the student gets lost because this teacher comes and say, I can. The other comes and say, I can. So the student say, which teacher is right? Which teacher is wrong? I say it's the same language, but the accent is different. So here in Senegal, we have the, the adaptability because people detect your nationality at, uh, from your accent. If you are from Gambia, from, from the Gambia or Ghana or Cameroon, when you speak, they know where you come from. So even in, uh, in our English clubs, sometimes you, you take a student who is a half plot, a plot, you ask it for plot translation, Sometimes the Pular is similar, a bit similar to, uh, Pular is a local language here in Senegal, but it's a bit similar to English. So when a Pular uh, ethnic group, when a Pular speak English, you can see that it's a bit similar to the American accent. But when you take a Bambara or a Sere, which uh, is a, an ethnic group, they speak very strongly. But when they speak English, you, you notice a difference. So it can be a, a, a barrier from just one language, but different accent. So I think it's unfair. It's one language. English is English. You can write the same word, but speak it differently. But it, couldn't, it shouldn't be a, a barrier. And uh, about uh, what people are talking about refugees, I cannot uh, go further because I'm on the other side in Africa but I can explain a bit about what happened here. So um, 
uh, we are a country of Teranga. People say Teranga. Teranga is a word of word, which means welcome. So when you come here, people are open to you. People uh, love strangers. They like strangers. When you come here, no matter your color, your race, your identity, your religion, people open you their, their hand, they welcome you, and they treat you in the way that when you leave, you, you wouldn't like to leave because of the love and the openness that people show you. So I think if it were everywhere in the world like that, people wouldn't have any problem. So to me, the color is just a color. The race is person, uh, belongs to uh, a, a group, but we should accept each other's differences. All people are not the same. Everything is not the same in this world, but we have to accept each other because the way you are is different from the way I am. But these, uh, the, the most important thing is what is in our head, what is in our mind, and the, the creativity and the good ideas that we have to overcome all those problems to make our lives better. So um, from uh, the accent that Crystal was saying, you are right. Because one day I, I, uh, I was told a story a friend of mine was working in an airport and then uh, a, a person from the Australia, you see, they speak very fastly. When she came, he told me, I need the standard operator. Standard operator. He works at the, uh, at, at the airport, translate in English, but he couldn't understand what the person is saying. So from just that, he could lost his job, you see. So I think when a native, native speaker speaks to a non-native speaker, they should reduce the speed of their speech so that they can give the person uh, the gist, to, to, to grasp the gist of the messages so that they can uh, give a reply. This is what I do in my class. When I speak sometimes they say, Sir, it's very fast. Please slow it down so that we can understand. But even when, one day when Meg, Meg sees that I greet if she is following, she was, uh, asking questions that I was translating for uh, a client, but sometimes I cannot get understand the question, so I ask it her to repeat. So we are different because when a native person speaks and a non-native speaks, there is a bit different that can be noticed. And uh, what I can say for immigration, here these days, presently people are fighting this phenomenon because many young people are leaving the country. They take boats, they go by the sea. I even wrote a poem recently, and then many people have died. And our country was on uh, national mourning, national mourning for the loss of the people who have lost their lives on the, on the, on the, on the, on the ships, on the boat at sea. So most of them had, uh, have returned, have gone back to their homes, but they lost hope. Even some people say, uh, when they, you, you give them the mic for interview, they say, I would rather die than go back to my home. So there is a lot of pressures. There are some factors that make them go away to find a better living condition or to find something better to go back home and support the family. You understand? So this is why sometimes people have to understand that people do not go to immigrate for making money only, but there are some pressures some social pressures in the own family or in the society, or even some people uh, risk their lives while staying in the, in the country. You see, this is the example of the person that I was helping. He had to leave, he had to flee because of something that in our, our religion do not, doesn't accept here. So if he, if he stay in the country, he, may, he could be killed. This is why he, he, he left the country to go to the United States. But why did he leave? Because here, there are people who reject him. And when he is rejected and go to a country to find a refuge, if that country rejects him back, where would he go? This is another problem. So people have to understand why people leave their homelands to go abroad. Because when uh, people from the USA come to our country in Africa, they have no problem. Here there are guides, there are tourist guides, there are people who when, once they see you, they approach you, they talk to you, they want to discover things, where you're from, they...
I think we're having technical difficulties. Like uh, you. There, he, he's back. They okay. appreciate you. They even give you everything you want. Uh, so you see, when you come here, people are open. Hello, you can hear me. People are open. People need to, to, to approach you to get more about where you're from, what you are here. They enjoy the difference of cultures, the difference of ethnicity, the difference of language. And uh, another anecdote that I, I sent to Meg is that one day when I left the university in Dakar, I was walking. I didn't have money to pay the transport. But I met two young women from uh, Nigeria. You see, they speak English there. But their accent is different from my accent here in Senegal. So they were asking somewhere they couldn't find. They lost direction. And once they met me, they stopped me and asked a question in English. So when I replied, they looked at each other. They said, wow, well, he speaks English. And I led them to where they wanted to go. And when we arrived, they gave me money that could pay for my transport for two weeks. So just from the language, I had something that could help me. So I say the language have, has to unite people, but not. separate them. Sorry, language has to unite people, but those native people have to understand that the way they speak is different from the non-native. And the fact that they don't understand could bring a problem because when a person you speak to doesn't understand what you say, maybe they could say something else or do something else different from what you wanted. So this is why I say that the accent is different, but the language is one. So we should accept different accent. And this is how we accept differences, races, colors, etc. So that we could exchange and try to make our lives better. Thank you all so much um, for, for your insights across um, skin color across language, even within language, um, how people are experiencing discrimination. Uh, I, I want to recognize that I think Crystal does need to leave soon. So uh, Crystal, if you want to give any last remarks before you go, uh, I'll turn it over to you. And then Kate has a question. Um, actually, Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll get, let Kate ask the question and then yeah. You can wrap can up your answer. Go ahead, go ahead and ask your question. The good thing is my meeting that I was supposed to go to actually moved to after Yay. this. So <laughs> you get me until the end of this. So go right ahead. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'll turn it over to Kate. So, and also to our participants, if you have a question, go ahead and put it in the Q&A box and then Professor, she can uh, pull it from there and we can pose it to our panelists. Um, my question, and it's funny, I work with some of you uh, pretty regularly, but I've, I haven't met you and I don't get to see your faces because everything that we do at Respond is, um, is, through, the, is through a platform that's online, right? So I, I just wanted to say that it's great to see you um, and to meet you, Francois, um, even though we're in the same city, um, I feel like because of this new reality that we're in, you're just as close as... Um, do do is in Senegal, right? So, um, but anyway, my question was for those of us who've worked with detainees in detention centers um, or who've known people who've been detained in immigration detention centers in the US, what challenges have you seen your clients or your family and friends uh, face as black immigrants, as black asylum seekers in the US? Uh, if if I can, sorry, I think Crystal wanted to talk. No, go ahead, go ahead. I'll go after. No problem. Okay, so for me, um, I think the challenge that I met, I don't know if it's, it was related to to the time from the phone call. So and again, the, the asylum seeker when they arrived to the United States, they came with a lot of baggage. I'm I'm talking about emotional baggage. So when you ask, when all this interview for credible fear of, for, by the lawyer in front of the court, in front of court or 
for translating uh, for the lawyer to understand, it's open a lot of boxes, it's like a Pandora box. And those 15 minutes are not enough. And I think maybe if they can have some advocacy to extend those, 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 um, those phone call, the time from the phone call, or have like a two session phone call. One should be for the trauma to, to really, really try to, 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 to help the, the, the candidate or the, the asylum seeker to, to heal or to calm him herself or because it's too, it's very short. It's very short, it's very painful to see that in the middle of something, the lawyer have lost patience or the system don't allow the lawyer to go dig further because of the minutes. So we have to repeat another call, another call, another call. And, and, and you found out that the, the person is not feeling comfortable to talk about what she, especially I'm talking about my female, uh, uh, I, I could say clients, they were not very comfortable to, to talk about what happened to them. And it took a very long, 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 because you have to enter in the culture to break through, to make her feel comfortable for, in order for her to hook out what's happened to her. And she doesn't want to revive it, to, re, to, re, uh, to leave it again. So the same thing from the, 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 the husband also. So I think phone calls should be extended. This, this one, and also or prepare something for the, on, on, the pre, on the detention facilities because apparently for what I understood, those detention facilities just they give you a pills uh, on, the, on the cup and then you go. There's nothing else to, to, it's really minimum because of that language barrier. So they just diagnose it very quickly and they say these are your five pills and maybe it's just a trunk, something to make you calm and to give them peace. Who knows? So I don't think they do a proper proper job there. So I think there's something they should dig a little bit further, in order to 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 help them to to face the the other administrative process which is in front of court, and to show to the judge that that person really fear for her her for his life to go back to a country he's coming from and to get asylum. So that's what I wanted to say. And I can add to that. I think for me, um, most of my translation were happening during COVID. So, um, you know, our clients, as we say, because a lot of time we're translating for um, lawyers. Um, it was a question of, you know, they didn't have access. You know, they were afraid um, of, um, you know, am I going to catch COVID? There's a lot of us here. Um, I, the other thing is not un fully understanding the process. Um, I think you know, when you, even when you try to explain it. And then the other side is the trust. Um, I'm asking someone to share something that is very, you know, the, some of them went through some very rough time. And for them to be able to be on that phone call with me and have to share the details. And it's not one time, because a lot of time when the lawyers are asking the question, they ask them multiple times, multiple ways. And it can be very frustrating. And when you have a whole family and the whole family has to do the same thing, I think, you know, it, it, you can hear the frustration. Um, you know, for some of them, it was probably like, you really don't believe me. If you keep asking the same question over and over again, it's like, you don't believe me. So what do I need to do so I can, um, you know, make you believe me? You really don't understand. And I think, um, you know, at one point for me, it was, it was hard. I'm not going to say it was easy because I feel like it could be my aunt, it could be my cousin that I'm speaking to and I have to try to convince them. I'm just here to help you. Um, and the, you know, you're being asked these questions so we can help you get on the other side of this. So I think, you know, and then there's also cultural difference. Even though I'm from the same country as them, a lot of them are not from, I'm from the capital. Um, and, you know, they have a different experience than I have. So just being able to connect on that. And if the moment I start speaking to the client, they want to know a little bit more about you and you can't even share that, but they can tell from my experience, from the little interaction, if they can feel like I'm not from where they are and I don't understand, it's even harder to break that, um, you know, like trying to convince them to trust
asking you to give me that information because in their mind and in where we are, there's so many layers um, when, you know, when the translation is happening and being able to help um, them feel comfortable, understand the process and feeling like we are really helped to help you. So that's what I wanted to add. Okay, uh, I just wanted to insert my own quick question here. Uh, wondering how each of your communities, ranging from here in Providence uh, all the way to Senegal, how have they responded to the movement for Black Lives, in particular this summer around Black Lives Matter? Uh, Francois, you pointed to some like differences that, that you may have experienced at the maybe African refugee, uh, like your African refugee experience in Providence was like rubbed up against understandings of like other people's understandings of African Americans. So wondering like how your communities have processed Black Lives Matter. I, I can start. Oh, go, go ahead. Okay. So I would like just to answer the question of Kate. Uh, there was someone, someone calling me. This is why I lost the network. Okay, That's so great. about the detainees, uh, yeah, about the detainees that we were, do you hear me? Okay, about the detainees that we were trying to interpret, uh, there are some challenges, of course. So what I noticed that is, uh, I, uh, what I noticed is that um, uh, the time that Michael Kalisa was talking is, is, is true. It's short and you cannot, uh, you cannot give all details or sometimes you call and the, and, the, and the call is cut, meaning that the card is off. So you cannot give more details or the detainee has to go back to, his, uh, to the center waiting, waiting for another call in, in, the, in the next week. So this may, be, may give frustration to the person who doesn't know what will happen because the call was off and then he doesn't have uh, more detail about his case. And I would like to suggest that uh, the, the response crisis or those who care about the detainees, they send an interpreter or a, a translator each two week, uh, two days or three days to go to the center, ask those clients about their needs, about what they feel inside the asylum and how they are treated so that they can express themselves because people, what they feel inside may, may, may give, put them in danger or if they, they, they overcome too much stress, it can cause a trauma. And this is what I would like to suggest, to send somebody to go there, to motivate them, to cool them down, to talk to them, to ask them questions so that he can exchange with, with them, you see. And uh, uh, I, 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 I had to ask uh, my client about the condition in the center. And what he told me, he didn't give me details, but he just said that, it's hard here. It's hard here means that the condition is bad. I don't know if it is about the food or the way they are treated or, 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 or else, but it's hard, meaning that something has to be done to support them. You see, this is why they, they need people to hurry so that they could be released as soon as possible. You see, and every time, every call, the last thing he asked me is, when will I get out? When will they release me? I say the case is not in my hand. I'm just here to translate for you, but be patient. Those people that I am working with, I'm sure that they will get you out because what they are doing is serious. If it were not serious, they wouldn't lose their time for you, you see. And uh, another thing is that the jet lag, the time that you call, it's different. Uh, your time is different from here. Sometimes uh, you fix an hour that I am not um, at ease with, but if I'm with family, I have a child, my wife, all the family around, you, you, you see, they disturb me. I have to go to upstairs or for answering call. Sometimes it is sunny, but I overcome the heat. Sometimes it's cold, but I can do anything. But because I want to help the person, I have to make a sacrifice because your sacrifice and my sacrifice will help somebody uh, have something uh, good for him. 
this is uh, what I wanted to say for uh, Kate. And coming to Elena, uh, Black Lives Matter has a great impact here. I even have a poem written and many people made a challenge, a video challenge for, uh, with that uh, poem. I will send it to you if you want. But people even created here movement and t-shirts and, uh, and, and, and they went out to protest what happened with George Floyd. You see, this has caused anger everywhere. Every, every black person has uh, uh, manifested their anger uh, with that death. And it's very regrettable, but may he so rest in peace. But I think that uh, it could, it could, it, uh, they could avoid that kind of thing if they, they were not uh, a racist attitude or it, if it were a white person, that shouldn't happen. So this is why I, I, I would like people to bear in mind that differences are differences, but we have to accept each other's differences, love one another. What I've said earlier is that when a white person come in Africa, people give them everything they want free. They look beyond the color, they look beyond everything. They, they, they want open to get out their houses and give the person the house. So you see, if people everywhere they do that, there wouldn't be these kinds of problems. So acceptance of differences is good. So Black Lives Matter also created other activist movements. And uh, many people, uh, as my, I myself, I have some t-shirt here with uh, the Black Lives Matter logo that I created myself. And people came and all the students, they bought that. I even had a class, a class on the Black Lives Matter explaining the student what happened to people, black people in the United States and to push them to stay in their countries because what you dream about is not what will happen when you go. You have to work in your country. You can make it here in your country because there are successful stories. I give them example, many examples, but you, you see it's because sometimes they are attracted by what they see and what they hear that people tell them in the United States. And another thing is that I taught a student here in, in Senegal, but she hated English. She didn't like English at all, but her father took her to the United States. Right now she's there. But when she talked to me, she corrects me. She corrects my accent saying, say, saying that you speak slowly or you have to change this, you have to change that. I, I said that it's because you are there in touch with native people, you, uh, surely you will speak uh, like, they, like they do. But I am here in my country, I'm not a native person. I, I don't have to mimic or to do like uh, as a native person. So let me speak my way and let them speak their way. But when we talk, we understand each other and this is what is important. I can I can also answer that question and I have two part actually um, I think if I look if I'm talking about in the Haitian community back home um, my Americanized friends or people that travel to the US um, sharing their feelings uh, it's like a big movement in Haiti where you saw people took the street like other countries, not at all. I think um, for many Haitians, marching out in the street is not something that we do because even if we do it, it doesn't necessarily change anything. So we come into that space um, with that feeling. What is that really going to change? Um, but it's also a conversation that I have with my own family. You know, I have a little cousin. He would love to come to the U.S., but I, you know, I share those information with him. That were not shared with me when I was growing up. I want him to know. I don't want your goal to be, I'm going to grow up, I'm going to go to the U.S., and I'm, you know, I'm going to be just like Crystal. Not at all. I want you to have a goal just beyond that. I want you to, yes, you can come to the U.S. because there are opportunities. You can study, but I want you to think beyond that because this is what's happening to Black child, Black boys just like you. 
um, I want you to take that education and go back home and help. Just like, wow. you know, oh, wow. I'm helping you or other people are helping you. You need to be able to go back home. Now, the Haitian community here, it's very, in a sense, divided because the older generation that are living here don't understand. Yes, we don't agree with the killing of, you know, Black people. But, but at the same time, you know, again, going out in the street is not something that we do. But my generation, my, you know, I have my sisters. We are all, we took to the street and protested against this because we do not agree with it. So I think there's like, you'll see a nuance between, you know, the people that were probably raised in America and understand and see that if we march and we go out in the street and we support and we say our life does matter and we take a stand at work, you know, within our friend group, there are changes that can happen, but it's also bringing in our older generation and explaining to them why do we need to do this and the changes that it can bring. So that was my perspective. Yeah, uh, in Rwanda, it brought a lot of uh, anger, like, um, because we found the video was very graphic and was a little bit, uh, was the way to say a little bit, it was uh, animalistic. And yeah, it brought a lot of anger. And yeah, like in Haiti, we don't march in Rwanda because uh, there's a lot of process about it. and. It's not easy to do to, to do a march, but also it resonates in the sense that it question also the system, like how this system works. Is this system works only for black people, and is it really worth it to go there and and be like and end up like him, like Floyd? Uh, what are the risks? What are the chances? And and it really resonate like differently, but it, it, it resonate like as, as as she said, both ways. Like the both extreme took their position, and it's still something back in the mind of people who are coming and visiting uh, the United States. So uh, they just tell you all the time, like, be careful, uh, don't argue too much with the police if they ask you. But at the same time, you so said, why should I argue if they, they have to do their job properly? And yeah, it's, it's, it's really um, a complicated topic. And, and I think it's something, it's like a symbol. It's a symbol that uh, we have to carry. Unfortunately, he passed away the wrong, I mean, the hard, he died the hard way. But it's a symbol that we all going to carry uh, and, and, and to remind ourselves all the time how the system works and, and what are the risks if you don't comply, comply because you don't have the same accent or you look different or you big or you you don't have nice appearance. So it's, it's really at the same time it's scary, but at the same time I remind you also to be very man mindful. Oh, thanks. Um, the Black Lives the Black Lives Matter movement um, in Providence. Um, it was it was interesting. Um, it definitely caught the attention of all the refugee youth first of all um, because they it got them very excited um, um, to you know fight for rights and also fight for justice um, and. Um, they were very, um, intrigued. Well, they were very into, um, getting involved with taking action. Um, we, um, were at protests. Um, I know that there were like, um, a few years ago, we had like, um, some school walkouts, um, and we were involved with, you know, we were within the crowd of like the protests of um, other um, youth around Providence. And we um, also had like youth who wrote poems um, as well as like ones who would sing songs. Um, and so the Black Lives Matter movement was very, very something that meant, uh, that means a lot um, to the refugee youth power movement. And so um, 
you know, after I, uh, after George Floyd, um, had happened, um, I think it made me think very deeply about like, you know, the start of this country and how it itself began, um, as to where it was, you know, a group of people who were in a country where their religion, um, their religious beliefs weren't respected and their religious, you know, they, they didn't, they didn't, they weren't getting the rights that they wanted. Um, and their voices weren't being heard within England. And so what did they decide? They decided to, you know, move and conquer a different land. And, you know, sometimes thinking about it, it's like, it's kind of like, I don't know. I think about it. I, I think about it sometimes and I'm like, we have so much in relation, you know, like how is it that like you ran from a country that wasn't respecting your rights and everything like that um one that was shoving your voice down your throat and it feels like you're doing that to like other human beings as well you know who are in the same country as you um but who have also kind of like felt the same pain as you but it's like you're doing the exact same things to them um and Man, as um as Dudu was saying, he was he he encouraged uh, some students to, you know, as some students who from Senegal want to move to America, as he's encouraging them to stay to, a, um, to stay in Senegal. Frankly, that's something that I'm, I've been like feeling the same as the same kind of like energy as to wanting to go back home, because like why should I continue to beg somebody for human rights when we're exactly the same? Like, who are you? not to you know not to sound like like you're not a nobody but at the same time it's like what is it that makes you better than me that i have to continue to like beg and beg and see my people go through all this pain um and man it's it's also it man it sucks because like i've always i've always thought about like you know i want black people to really unite and there's a lot of like I feel like there's a lot of uh, separation within the black community as well but if there was like more um unity and man um I'm sorry I'm I'm like I'm losing my, my my place but um Okay, so it's like, I don't know, like, um, being like the Black Lives Matter movement was also um, very encouraging towards um, the youth, because I loved how it like let them know that um, it makes like, I don't know, I feel like sometimes you feel very like with the amount of racism that's in America, it makes you feel very less less human sometimes and it makes you feel like you're not capable of um, becoming of like, you know, a great person or being able to um, complete like um, certain things in life, like educate, like a certain level of education or um, become like somebody great in life, you know? Um, and I'm, I'm, it's, it's very discouraging um, to youth and man. I just, I just um, would like to have like that message, me message to like you know to all of our refugees to let them know that like I don't know even though you're in a new place just know that like you are still strong as and as smart as like many people here and frankly you just you just got to do it I don't know it's really it's really like yeah that's really all I have to say to it. So I've seen you in action as a youth educator and your peers, they look up to you and they're getting that message through your work. I know they are. Um, so thank you for all that. Um, just in closing, we are at time, but our amazing director, Patsy Lewis, has asked a question maybe in just one sentence. And I think it's so hard to answer this question in one sentence, but how do all of you manage to protect yourself from the emotional trauma of hearing horrific experiences that migrants relate 
I'll go ahead and start and say it's not easy, but you know, when I feel like it's a little too much, I just take a day. <laughs> um, you know, I do something for me. Um, you know, and then go right back to it. Um, because at the end of the day, this is a work that I'm passionate about. It may not be easy, but, you know, it's okay to just take a step back. Um, it's, you know, and not feel guilty as well, because we tend to also feel guilty because I could be helping more people if I wasn't taking the time for me. But how can I give 100% of myself if I am not 100%? So that's what I would say. Thank you. Michael? Uh, for me, the same way, I take a day for myself. Mm. Uh, the funny part, I, I go to watch cartoons. So, yeah, I look, I watch uh, Tom and Jerry, all those childish things who try to bring you a <laughs> sense of humor to, to bring you say that something else can happen also. It, it's difficult, uh, it's painful. And especially when, when, as Dudu say, if you are a father of a boy or a girl and you look at them and you hear what happened to others and you don't want that happen to, to, to your loved one or to anyone else. And uh, yeah, you just put yourself on the screen and, and look at the funniest movie or cartoons, especially cartoons, because they are very expendable in terms of imagination and, and that distracts you from, from the pain. You do? Do you do your muted? Yeah, you can hear me now. Yes. Okay, I, I'm sorry, I missed the question because uh, I was answering to somebody. On the How other. do you deal with the emotional pressure of hearing about all these difficult experiences that migrants are facing? How do you personally? Okay, um, it's, it's really sad when somebody is suffering, but uh, that's life. That's life. Sometimes people uh, have choices that they don't know that is bad for them. But uh, after hearing all those kind of, his, of stories, of, uh, of experiences, it makes me step back and say, what can I do for them? What can I do for people who overcome this kind of situation in my country. We cannot cross our hands and look at them like, uh, I don't care. So we have to do some, something. People have to give help, support uh, everyone. So this is, this is what motivated me to keep translating because the first time I did it, I informed it another friend of mine. What he told me is, uh, uh, do they pay you every time? I said, no, I don't do it for money. I do it for support. So can't come and join. He said, I don't have time for that. So if every person does something for his own interest, I think people won't live uh, better because we have to give what we have for others and to receive from them what they have exchange, you see. So those experiences are very terrible, hard because I live those kind of experience here in our country. I said that many people died recently on, on the ships uh, or you see uh, relatives in your family who went abroad and they never came back. You don't know if they are dead or not. That happens to me. I had an uncle who moved to another country and till now 20 years abroad, we don't know. We cannot join him by phone. We cannot see him. We, can, we don't know if he is still alive. So you see, sometimes you imagine that, so you have lived, similar experiences. So this is why when we talk to, when I talk to the, to the detainees, the clients, before the end of the call, I profited one minute to, to talk to him in Wolof. Uh, K, uh, the, the, the other doesn't understand, but I try to give words of relief, relief to help him feel confident that he will be released soon. So, because I know that if I put my play, myself in his place, I, I, I know that it's difficult. It's difficult when you are in a detention center, you don't know what will happen to you. When will you go out of that and, and make your life the way that you want? So it's very difficult, it's very hard. Sometimes emotionally, emotionally you feel down, you feel beaten by that. But 
we have to accept, but not accept and stay away, but accept and do something. And so Um, to be honest, I've I've heard some stories uh, myself, but at the same time, I've always been, um, I've always either prayed after, um, for the person and for their strength to have gone, you know, through something like that, um, and continue to pray for the best for them for the many years coming through, um, and, um. Man, I think something that's that I've always like uh, noticed was an issue was you know when people do go through a lot of like traumatic things. I don't think like um, many people or like many refugees talk about like mental health as the way it is in like America, and frankly, I think that's like something that like would need to be like um, kind of like. Um, something like no that that might need to be added in a way just because some people like really go through deep damaging things and um, it affects like the household sometimes and also just affects them as like a personal person in their personal life um, continuing to grow uh, and you know um I would just wish that they had the same knowledge of how to um, grow um, and continue to, you know, learn different alternatives to um, deal with um, some things that they've, either memories that they've had um, and, you know, or things that they just never really talk about. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to our four esteemed panelists. Thank you to our guests for staying with us. I saw that Carolina is a translator joining us from Minnesota. I uh, wish we could know all of you. Um, uh, giving the last word now to Kate, because I think that Kate could offer something about how she also stays afloat uh, as a translator herself. And then any words, Kate, you want to share about how to get involved with this project or Respond's work? I just um, a plug for respond. We actually have a therapist on staff. Uh, she's part of our leadership team. She speaks, uh, I think, five different languages, and she's available to help folks who are volunteering with us. So um, I would recommend if you if you want to get involved in this sort of work uh, to get involved in an organization like respond that takes care of its volunteers and its leadership team. Uh, and if you would like to sign up to work with Respond, our website is respondcrisistranslation.org. And I just wanted to say thank you so much uh, to all of you for being with us today. <laughs>